uh, we're all from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, that we've been working on for the last few years. And uh, it's, it's getting better and better as you know, the days go on. Um, so uh, just by way of introduction, I'm Adi Kamdar. I'm an activist at EFF. You want to go down? Sure. Uh, I'm Nate Cardoso. I'm one of the staff attorneys at EFF. And one of the, thing, one of the several things that I work on is the Coders' Rights Project. So I defend uh, hackers, coders, innovators, programmers, uh, try and keep you guys out of trouble and try and help you get out of trouble when you get in it. And that's part of what I'm on this panel for. I, and, uh, is it working? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, split up. Uh, and I'm uh, Ranga Krishnan. I'm a technology fellow at the EFF, and uh, I actually joined uh, just last year uh, to work specifically on this project. And it, it has been uh, very exciting, and I hope to show where we are with it today. Um, so the Open Wireless Project um, it, it has a lot of roots, um, but but one of the one of the um, issues that this is trying to solve is one that we may have all experienced, that I definitely experienced. Um, in fact, th the other day I was at home and uh, my internet went out and I, I checked the available networks and there were, there were 15 networks. Um, and uh, most of them were locked. Um, and I couldn't access anything, um, which was unfortunate. Um, uh, and uh, I did see one unlocked network and it was called Big Blue House Guest. Um, and I knew exactly which house this was on my street. Um, and I'm like, great, you guys are, are going to allow me to use your, uh, your internet. Thank you, friendly neighbors. Um, un unfortunately, I ran into this uh, right afterwards, a nice uh, captive portal. Um, and it says, you know, enter the guest account password, um, which I didn't know. And I didn't really want to go over and knock on the door and ask for the password. Um, this is the sort of issue where uh, you know, we're living in a world where w walking down the street, sitting at home, in the office, whatever, we have a bunch of uh, wireless networks available, um, yet none of them are actually accessible. Um, and uh, it, that it seems inefficient to us. Um, th there's another story from around a couple years ago when um, we were launching this project um, where um, uh, Hurricane Sandy happened. Um, how many of you guys are from around here? Um, I can't see anything, so I'm assuming there's some hands up. Uh, <laughs> I realized that was useless. Um, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry you guys had to experience Hurricane Sandy because uh, it, it seemed awful. But um, uh, the one of the things that came out of that is with the power outages and with the outages of service, um, uh, we saw things like this. Uh, this was a friend who tweeted this out. Um, awesome picture of internet infrastructure, New Yorkers idling for free working Wi-Fi outside of Starbucks. Um, and this is actually right around the corner. Um, the, Starbucks is one of the few places that was offering free Wi-Fi that was working and that people could actually access. And you know, these were people who uh, needed to get in contact with people, um, needed to check their email, needed to send out, um, you know, I'm okay, I don't know, Twitter updates. Um, the, these were people who needed to use the internet and yet they couldn't. Um, and uh, the one place that was oper offering um, uh, some sort of uh, open Wi-Fi, some sort of free Wi-Fi, was um, Starbucks. Uh, so uh, with this in mind, we, we started the open wireless movement. And um, the point of the open wireless movement is to encourage um, open wireless, is to, is to create a world where open wireless is the norm. Um, and uh, you know we're, we're imagining a world, uh, a future with ubiquitous open internet. Um, why would you do this? Why would you open up your wireless networks? Um, uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, part of it could be because of sharing. Um, sharing is actually a very important thing. Um, you know, not all of us are using all of our bandwidth all the time. Not all of us are using our networks all the time. Uh, we've been in situations where we needed to get on the internet. Um, and we couldn't, and it would be nice if someone shared their internet with us. Um, uh, we, uh, EFF actually has a board member, uh, Bruce Schneier, who, um, who runs an open wireless network, and it says, it, I like his quote a lot. It, he says, to me, it's basic politeness to run an open wireless network. Um, providing internet access to guests is kind of like providing heat and electricity or a hot cup of tea, and, and who doesn't like that? Um, but besides access, um, why open wireless? Um, access can't be the only issue. There are a lot of uh, um, groups and, and people advocating for access to the internet, um, and that's, that's an issue that 
a lot of people are dealing with right now, um, and open wireless by no means is the be-all, end-all of this, but um, it is a step in the right direction. Um, one of the big reasons is, is privacy. Um, now, how can, how can opening up your network be conducive to privacy? And this is something we're actually gonna talk about quite a bit from a, from a legal perspective and a technical perspective. Um, but um, one reason is because right now when we're mobile, right now when we're, when we're roving around, um, we're tied to these things. We're tied to our smartphones. Um, and um, uh, when we want to access data, when we want to access the internet. And um, these smartphones use um, networks offered by folks like these. Um, um, and that's kind of an issue, right? If, if we want to be mobile, if we want to use um, devices, if we want to connect to the internet and we're not close to a, a, a wireless network that we have access to, um, we have to pay a contract. We have to use these sorts of services. Um, and our smartphones are, are essentially tracking devices. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if, if um, you know, the, the privacy world we imagine actually fostered uh, uh, the sort of innovation that we're, we're, we're seeking? Um, if it actually fostered innovation that didn't have to rely on these few big players and could actually take advantage of all of these wireless networks um, running through us right now. Um, and, and this could be any sort of innovation. Here are four random pictures I found. Um, if you want to connect your dog, if you want to uh, uh, have a watch that does something smart, if you want a face mask, I'm not actually quite sure what that is, but it looked kind of cool. Um, uh, uh, and it could be connected to the wireless internet, and wouldn't that be great? Uh, um, potentially, I don't know, but but these are the sorts of innovations that uh, you can't necessarily use out in the open because uh, you, uh, you know, AT and T and Verizon and and so um, have this sort of uh, domain covered. Um, one of the big questions that that people ask is, all right, fine, I'm 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 maybe okay with opening up my wireless internet. I may be okay with opening up even a part of it. Um, uh, but doesn't this, doesn't opening up my wireless network just reward freeloaders? Um, can't people just get on and um, do whatever they want with it and not pay for anything, and doesn't that suck? Um, and, and our answer is no. Um, uh, you know, it, this is the sort of world that we want to live in. We're trying to imagine a future where uh, having that sort of uh, culture of sharing um, and having that sort of culture of openness is something that we can um, actually foster and actually uh, go towards. Um, so we're trying to fight against this mentality that this is, uh, this is a bad thing, that this is my wireless internet, I need to lock it down and have it be mine, mine, mine. Um, because uh, we think with sharing, with open wireless, um, it's sort of a rising tides um, effect and everybody, everybody just benefits. Um, so with that, we're going to get into uh, the fun legal matters. That's me. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm, is this on? Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Great. Um, as I said earlier, I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney at EFF. Uh, and one of the things I do is uh, counsel the Open Wireless Project. I also do coder's rights. So now is my, my quick little lawyer stuff disclaimer. I am a lawyer. Um, I'm not your lawyer. And nothing I say will change that. Uh, unless you're already one of my clients, in which case I'm not talking to you right now. Um, so I will not be giving legal advice today. If you come up uh, to the microphone after we're done talking, which we will invite you to do, and you ask a question that calls for legal advice, this is not a confidential setting, so I can't give it to you in this setting. Uh, I will give you my card, and we can talk about it later uh, in a confidential setting. But this isn't one of those. OK. Copyright. There are several, and I'm, I'm going to address sort of three, sort of a little more than three sets of reasons uh, why open wireless isn't a bad idea. Um, copyright is, is one of the objections that a lot of people have to open wireless. And, and what do I mean by that? If I, uh, if, if, if I torrent a, a whole ton of movies uh, without uh, using any sort of protection online, chances are I'm going to get a DMCA uh, notice or a six, six strikes notice or some sort of complaint, right? Um, if I don't do that and I open my, my wireless network to others, uh, is that a problem? Um, no, I don't think it is. Uh, and, and there's a number of reasons why, why that's the case. Uh, if you're not the person uh, doing bad stuff online, especially with copyright, uh, you're not going to be held responsible. Uh, in copyright, there are, there, there's one way that you can be held responsible if you're not the one doing the bad thing, copyright infringement. 
uh, and that's secondary liability, and that comes in two flavors, uh, contributory liability and vicarious liability. Uh, these are doctrines which uh, are extremely fuzzy and, and have a lot of ins and outs, but, but what we need to know about them for, for these purposes is that contributory liability uh, requires essentially that the network operator have knowledge of what's going on and caused or induced that behavior. Uh, and for vicarious liability, the network operator has to have the right and ability to control the copyright infringement going on and receive direct financial benefit uh, from the copyright infringement. Luckily with open wireless, uh, n those factors are not satisfied for either contributory or vicarious liability. Uh, if, if I open the, the wireless network at my house, um, you know, I don't have actual knowledge that anyone is using it to, uh, to do copyright infringement unless they come tell me, uh, and I'm certainly not inducing uh, them to do so. I'm not saying uh, this is, you know, unless I put a big sign up on, in front of my house, they connect to openwireless.org SSID and use it to torrent your movies, uh, I'm not in inducing uh, copyright infringement. Uh, don't do that, that's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> vicarious liability is similarly the same. Uh, if, if I'm a neutral network operator, I don't have the right and ability to control what people are doing uh, on my network. Uh, and I'm not receiving a direct financial benefit from it either. Um, if you have an open wireless network at your house, uh, chances are you are not receiving a direct financial benefit from that. Um, but there's some other things that, that can help us out here too. And, and uh, this is one of the aspects of the DMCA which is not entirely bad. Uh, the DMCA, uh, and there's the code number, I, I was told that maybe if there are lawyers in the crowd that can get CLE credit for this, so that's why I actually included the case, I, I, there's some case titles later down uh, and, and the, the statute, so there's uh, section 512 of the DMCA. Uh, creates a safe harbor for network providers. Uh, this is completely optional, network providers do not have to take advantage of, of it if they don't want, but it's often a good idea and we have a plan for how they can do this with open wireless. Um, we've crafted a sample policy. Uh, one of the requirements for the safe harbor, uh, if you want to take advantage of the DMCA safe harbor provision, uh, is that you have a policy, uh, a DMCA policy, uh, and we have a sample for you. And the policy says uh, that, you know, you can't use this for copyright infringement, uh, and that you, the, the network operator will terminate repeat infringers. Uh, and the, the other part of the safe harbor is that it must accommodate rights holders' technical measures. Uh, those technical measures must be jointly agreed upon. That's never happened, so we don't really have to worry about that. Um, so, safe harbor. You, uh, in order, oh, ooh, 512M, sec, subsection M of section 512, says that the network provider does not need to affirmatively monitor the network to qualify for safe harbor. And that it even comes under the nice little subheading privacy. Um, so, what is Safe Harbor in general? Uh, it is a way that will provide, it is a way to provide immunity to the network provider to DMCA uh, complaints. We think that the sample policy that we've crafted at openwireless.org uh, and running an open wireless network on, at home or at your small business, uh, and, and if you post this policy or if you refer to it, which we think we're doing by having your SSID say openwireless.org and the policy's right there at openwireless.org. Um, there, there's a good argument, it is untested, uh, that that would qualify and you would not be liable uh, under the DMCA. Negligence. Some lawyers, uh, and I won't call them trolls, but they're trolls, uh, have, uh, have decided that the very act of running an open wireless network at your house is negligent. Luckily, they're wrong, and the two courts to have addressed it directly have told them that they're wrong uh, in very, very strong language. Uh, running an open wireless network is not negligence. Um, why? I mean, probably because that's what wireless was originally meant to do, right? It's not a breach of the duty of care if that's the standard, um, which is completely true. Risk. This is, uh, this, this is something, um, this is one of the more uh, strong objections to open wireless. It, when we 
Uh, after Andy Greenberg's story on this project came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Reddit thread was dominated by people saying, if I run an open wireless network at my house, I'm gonna get swatted, right? I'm gonna get a SWAT team busting down my door uh, for people downloading child porn and doing whatever else bad people do on the internet. Um, that is not completely out of the question, however, a lot of people run open wireless today and it doesn't, the SWAT team scenario doesn't happen very often. Uh, and the more people <laughs> who run open wireless, the less likely this is gonna be. Um, so there's a little bit of a first mover problem, but luckily you're not gonna be the first mover. The first mover was years and years ago. Um, if, you know, if you're running open wireless and uh, police comes to investigate and they see that you're running open wireless, you know, maybe that would help you out a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes police don't do that thorough of an investigation before they break down your door, so that's not a, uh, that's not surefire. But there are some other things we can do to, minim uh, to mitigate the risk here. Uh, and, and one of those things is in a future release of, uh, of the software that Ranga is gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna have the option of routing all of the uh, guest network traffic over a VPN of your choice or over Tor, um, and that will uh, not lead anyone back to your IP. Uh, obviously this is, um, I'm not recommending that you do your child porn surfing uh, over Tor or a VPN. In fact, I recommend that you do not do that. Um, but hopefully most people don't, don't do really horrible things online. Um, I, you know, I've been running an open wireless network at my house for years and I've never been swatted, but you know, uh, I, I don't think I'm unique in that. So I think the risk, uh, it, the risk is there, but it is overstated. Um, there are some other things which I, I don't really have a slide for, which I, I do want to talk about. As Adi said, um, how does open wireless increase your privacy and the privacy of others? Uh, right now, there's a, I wouldn't say it's a legal theory, but there's a sort of prevailing attitude that a, a person's identity can be determined simply by their IP address. Um, we think that's wrong. We think an IP address can sometimes be a proxy for identity, but often isn't. Uh, and that is absolutely not conclusive. And, and courts are starting to come around to this. Um, it's, it's been tested most often in the copyright troll situation um, where you know, Malibu Media sues a 79-year-old grandmother for downloading unspeakable title. Um, and the 79-year-old grandmother says, look, I wasn't the one who downloaded Unspeakable Title. Uh, it couldn't possibly have been me. And they say, well, you're the subscriber on the IP address. And she said, yeah, but that doesn't mean it was me. Um, so the more people who do open wireless, the harder it is going to be as a legal matter to claim that an IP address is your identity and that your identity is your IP address. Um, we, we don't think that's a good thing. Uh, secondly, uh, the sort of ubiquitous tracking um, that is permissible, uh, permissible technically due to the fact that we all have a tracking device in our pockets, uh, and as Adi alluded to, the network is controlled generally by a, a very small handful of very large providers. Um, open wireless can go a long way to change that. And the sort of ubiquitous tracking that something like an AT&T smartphone allows uh, will be a lot harder if I'm hopping from, hopping anonymously from one wireless network to another. Uh, and you know, ubiquitous tracking of everybody is not good, right? One of the things that we do at EFF is we sue the NSA um, to make them stop tracking all of us all the time. Uh, ubiquitous open wireless is not a panacea here, but it will make their job more difficult, um, which we think is good. Um, you know, I guess the, the analogy here is it's creating a bigger haystack, um, which is good for you and good for the world. And that's the end of lawyer stuff. So should I move it? Or I yeah, you can. Okay, you, you can move the slides. Yeah, I'll do this. So um, I'm going to talk about where all of this thinking at the EFF led which was that, uh, that the concepts were great, but uh, people who even wanted uh, to deploy this open wireless had some technical challenges. And so uh, in order to make this real, we, we needed to address those technical challenges and, and make it easy for people to do what they really wanna do. 
So um, that's the motivation. And so we decided we would create a, um, a router firmware that people could uh, put on to existing hardware that they could get you know, off the shelf. Um, and um, that would be the start. And then we would see the kind of interest we got and then think about what the next steps are. Um, so we started off with you know, how do we make sharing easy? But we realized that we needed to solve a couple of other problems, which is um, the security and, and speed. And um, so my next slides are going to talk about that. But before that, I want to mention that the uh, firmware image that we are launching today uh, in, in conjunction with this conference um, we're, um, is at that URL uh, over there. Um, you don't need to remember it. Uh, we'll, we'll have a blog post on the EFF website um, shortly, uh, which will have uh, details. Uh, if you're subscribed to the EFF Twitter feed, We'll be tweeting about it. So um, if you're interested, you, uh, we encourage you to download it and, and try it out. Right. So uh, I w wanted to explain like the three goals that I listed there for this router firmware, uh, starting with security. And I, I put it up on top there because um, even though we started with sharing, we realized this was the biggest problem that we needed to solve. Um, uh, the you know the the things that we needed to do for sharing were relatively small in comparison, whereas this was a huge problem that many people in industry have flagged, and, and there isn't really anybody um, um, with a solution today. And so it, it's it's also the largest component of work that we need to do, and we see, we see this as a multi-year or multi-decade effort to to really uh, make this happen. Um, so. Uh, basically, uh, Soho routers, the routers that you know, most of you have in your home uh, or small office, uh, are hopelessly compromised. Uh, this has been documented over the course of the last year uh, by many security firms, including our partner, uh, Independent Security Evaluators, uh, who've written a, a few articles about it. Um, and uh, one thing they noticed was even though they had published all this, there really wasn't much of a response from the manufacturer community. They were still shipping the same old things with the same old Linux kernels without the fixes and with the same broken uh, web user interfaces. And so um, w w what we decided is, uh, you know, since a lot of the attacks uh, do happen through the web UI that the uh, uh, routers uh, expose to users, we would develop an entirely new one um, focused not only on security, but also on simplicity, uh, because we wanted to make it really easy for people to use and, and set up open wireless networks. So that's, that was the first part of the initiative. Uh, I mentioned that we're collaborating with uh, independent security evaluators, but we're also uh, working with uh, other uh, uh, people in the uh, security industry uh, to help us you know, pen test, audit, uh, and improve uh, this router. And um, uh, what we realized is one of the reasons that the router security is so bad is that the software on the routers is not updated. Um, you know, your, your phone automatically updates its software, your apps automatically update, but router firmware uh, is, is rarely uh, set to do that. Uh, some of the problems in the past were router updates could break routers because of their limited uh, memory footprint. But today, they have plenty of memory. You can have two copies of images. You can, if you fail, you can go back to the old ones. So these are problems that can be solved today, but are not widely solved. And so uh, we are focused on creating a secure uh, software update mechanism uh, for these routers, which is not only uh, provide security by patching bugs, but um, we wanted to add an additional uh, protection because you know of our concerns with privacy, concerns with overreach of government in, in targeting individuals, uh, that the software update process itself could be a way in which people could be uh, spied upon or their rights violated. And so um, we decided that the way to address this was to use TOR, which is, you know, as many of you know, was another project that came out of the EFF um, uh, or, or was supported by the EFF. Uh, uh, and, and we continue to support it. Uh, 
Yeah, and the purpose of that was the router would fe will fetch uh, the information about what the most current software is, the metadata that decides you know, whether it's, it is going to update and what the file that it needs to use to update is over the TAR network. And what this does is, you know, whatever server it is reaching out to, uh, if there are intermediaries in between who can intercept that traffic, they cannot know who it is that is requesting this information, this metadata information. And so in that case, EFF or whoever else, and, and, and you know, one of the goals is to set uh, an example of how this can be done so that other people can adopt this kind of practice, is then you know, if, if uh, you're uh, requested to push a malware to a particular user, uh, you can honestly say, we don't have a way to do that. We, we, uh, there is no way in this system in which we can know that this is the person you're trying to reach. And the only way to send malware is to send it to everybody. And, and when one does that, it usually defeats uh, uh, the interest the government has because then that bad malware would be, I mean, the malware would be detected very soon. And, and so they, uh, there is no interest in doing this. So uh, in fact, this mechanism that I'm talking about, we have it in our, uh, uh, software that we're releasing today, uh, um, and uh, uh, we hope to make it more and more robust as uh, going forward. And uh, uh, we are, uh, w w one of the other aspects of security is being actually able to change the software in case there is a, a problem. Uh, many routers use binary blobs, which uh, you know can only be provided by the manufacturer and uh, it creates two problems. One is if there's a problem in the binary blob itself, nobody can fix it except the manufacturer who has no interest because there's no business in this low-end router segment to be fixing these things. The team that built it has uh, you know, moved on and they're doing more interesting, more uh, remunerative things and, and there's nobody to do it. And, and secondly, um, once you freeze a binary blob, you freeze all of the software around it. So you cannot even upgrade the Linux kernel around it if you know, there were problems there. So, you know, it's very important to have uh, uh, software that can be completely built from scratch so that we can fix problems and really give ownership of the device uh, to the uh, homeowner and that they are not beholden to anybody else. And in this, you know, we agree with our friends in the Free Software Foundation who are also uh, have a, um, a, a router initiative uh, and I encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, so the second thing is speed, and this is um, people, let me just step back a little bit. So the security came out because people might say, hey, I don't want to have an open wireless channel because maybe I'm exposing myself to security problems. And I kind of skipped that part. And when we looked into that question, what we realized was, you know, routers were hopelessly broken, independent of having to open a wireless channel. And so, I mean, I, I, so this a story with speed is something similar. You know, people might say, hey, you know, what about when I want to use the internet and you have a bunch of, you know, uh, guests that are, you know, downloading movies or something and I, I get a terrible uh, uh, experience. And so uh, when we looked into this, uh, we realized that independent of having an open wireless network, people had terrible experience just if they were the only users. If they had, uh, you know, multiple applications, maybe a web browsing session, maybe voice, maybe some large download happening simultaneously. Typically, the latency sensitive application, the voice uh, or gaming, suffers significantly way beyond what is actually, uh, you know, required. And this is because of a problem called buffer bloat, where because memory is cheap, you know, buffers in devices have grown and that tends to uh, uh, buffer up big queues of packets. And then so the, your latency sensitive applications are not getting the performance they want. They're not getting that priority that's needed. And this is a problem that uh, 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 a few people in the community had pointed out, uh, uh, networking community had pointed out a few years ago. And there's a project called Serovert uh, uh, run by Dave Tatt and, and Jim Geddes that has been focused on uh, fixing this problem. And fortunately for us, the, at this point, after about three years of research and implementation and bug fixing, they really are at a point where their work is, is complete, at least in some aspects. 
And so we are leveraging that. And what that does is not only can we solve the problem of uh, having a home user have a better experience, but those same algorithms, they help us share the internet between the guest user and the host user in, in a better way. And so um, we're we are using Serovert for that. And then looking down into the future, uh, you know, we want to make uh, ISPs live up to their promise, those numbers they give you when they sell you the plans. Um, uh, and, and, and so we are pl ho hoping to have software in there that will uh, measure uh, on a continuous basis. You know, you can run speed test, a one-shot test, but then you don't know what's happening in the middle of the night, or you don't know when you know what's happening at other times that you may care about. And uh, you know, having a router do these do this testing has a lot of benefits. So uh, we could have a continuous sample of you know what performance you're getting, and then show the ISP the chart saying, "Hey, this is what I'm actually getting." So we want to have that. That also helps with censorship because often censorship can be subtle. If you make a site slow, it's probably as good as censorship for a lot of purposes. So um, we want to you know, include that as well. So those are the aspects for speed. And then coming to sharing where we actually started, uh, you know, people care about, uh, especially internationally, not exceeding a monthly bandwidth cap that their ISP might have. So they, they, they're happy to share their internet, but they don't want to be in a position to pay more and, uh, uh, and similarly, they, they care about their own uh, internet experience. And so what we uh, are including in the interface to this router is a simple way uh, for uh, the hosts to set a, a bandwidth fraction that the guest users can get, and um, also an easy way to monitor how much cumulative data has been used by the guest user. So if your cap is you know, 300 gigabytes or something, you may say, okay, I'm happy to give away 50 gigabytes. And so we, we keep track of that for you and say, okay, now if that's exceeded, maybe you turn off your um, uh, guest network. So move, moving to the next slide. So where are we with, with all these goals? Uh, go ahead. So here's the router. Uh, we. Uh, decided we would hold back the details until uh, uh, this conference, primarily to allow all of you to buy this model, uh, <laughs> because it is an older model of router. It is a, a Netgear uh, WNDR3800. It's an 802.11n router. Uh, uh, it has been very popular uh, among hackers. It's a very stable, you know, good piece of hardware, which supports completely open software. and. Uh, uh, we chose that not only for those reasons, but that is also the router on which the Serovert project has built, and that is the only router that they support. So uh, we, we have used that. And uh, Serovert itself, as I mentioned, it's a, it, what it is is a derivative of OpenWord focused on routing research, and they feed back their stuff into mainline OpenWord and the kernel. And so we're using that as the software base. Having said that, I just want to say that this router we are launching with will not be the long-term router that we plan to support. It's an older router. There's much more powerful hardware that allows us to do many more interesting things uh, that are actually available, but they were not quite available in the schedule that we wanted. So we may move to uh, something like a dual-core um, one gigahertz ARM processor-based device in the future for a more widespread um, distribution of this. Um, uh, product. So. Right. Okay. So actually, so Adi, can I request you to do a demo since uh, you're... I would be happy to. Okay. <laughs> Let's make sure this works. Uh, so we're going to do a demo. Um, uh, we're we're going to demonstrate the web UI for you guys because um, So big, small. Great, great. It's not <laughs> mirrored, so this sucks. Um, okay, so um, um, we wanted to make this as easy as possible and as simple as possible. And um, you can turn on the mirroring if you want. I could. I'm not going to do that. Um, maybe I should. So what he's showing is the screen that you will see when you first install the uh, the firmware. 
and uh, it'll it'll basically ask you to set your administrator password. Um, you can do whatever you want. It's uh, yeah, minimum eight character right now. And then it asks you to set the network SSID for your private Wi-Fi network. So the um, openwireless.org, you know, shared uh, Wi-Fi network. Uh, it has a fixed name as of now. We don't, we're not allowing that to be changed, and that'll you, you'll see that going forward. So, good. Um, and then, uh, do you want to explain why the passphrase is not not masked? Not oh, okay. Masked. So this in in this setup phase, we we thought that it would be uh, in, in a fairly private um, environment, and that it would help people to, uh, in terms of remembering it or or you know noting it down somewhere to have it actually be visible. Uh, when in the future, you know, people actually log in using this administrative password, we do not show the password. So. Diceware rocks, by the way. If you don't know what that is. And, and that's it, right? Like it, it, it's all set up. Um, and then this is the this is the dashboard. So um, um, right now it, it will show you. Oh, hey, this is connected to the internet. Um, uh, you have your private Wi-Fi network. We are at Hope. Um, you have your open wireless network that you can toggle on and off um, uh, if you want. Um, there's a setting down. Well, maybe it's in the other settings. Um, and. There are a bunch of settings. Ranga, do you want to walk through yeah, these? Yeah, sure. So uh, first is uh, you could change your password. Uh, the main sec one of the main security features we, we decided would be useful here is uh, keep the web UI fairly simple. The number of things you can do uh, are limited and for a purpose. Uh, and we believe that it's adequate for most people. Now, if you want to do more, um, then we, we decided it would be through SSH access. And uh, for that, we allow people to upload their uh, SSH public key. Uh, we did not want to allow password access because, again, you know that's a that's a potential uh, attack. And so uh, this, I think you can click on that you know, on the, to click SSH enable. So basically, it brings up a window where you can enter your public key, and and uh, and send it, and it will be stored, uh, and. Uh, once you complete the login, uh, there, there is no further upload possible through the web interface. So you have to SSH into the device to add more keys or change the key. Uh, and, and I think that makes it much uh, more secure. Um, and uh, the next, uh, just, just a little bit further up. I, mean, I just wanted to see, was there anything else there? OK. So uh, the ISP speeds there are things that uh, we require users to enter to optimize the uh, performance of the router, the queuing algorithms that are in there that we uh, got from Serovert. Uh, and uh, uh, you, know, you could do this through speed test, or you know, maybe you have uh, knowledge of it already. And so you've entered the upload and download speeds. Uh, the private Wi-Fi network, you can uh, you know, change the SSID. You can change, you know, change the usual Wi-Fi parameters over there. And uh, as Nate mentioned, we plan to support uh, a VPN Tor uh, for all of the traffic uh, on that private network, uh, as well as on the open wireless. Right now, that's grayed out because it hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, on the open wireless, the main feature, as I mentioned, is the ability to set the bandwidth fraction that you uh, will limit the guest users to, uh, and then uh, you can also set the maximum, uh, you know, megabytes or gigabytes of data that you're willing to allow guest users to use. And what happens is, if that number is exceeded, the open wireless interface automatically gets switched off. Uh, we're looking into having, you know, a, a more uh, graceful mechanisms that maybe throttle it down and kind of stretch it out over the course of the month. But right now, it'll turn it off. And then. Um, uh, the reset there is to reset the counter on that uh, uh, you know monthly cap, uh, and then we will also sub, uh, support in the future uh, you know setting which day of the month uh, you're using for that uh, and have an auto reset. Uh, and then similarly, the there are you know wireless features for that, and then there's one additional security feature 
uh, for the open wireless. A lot of the criticism of open wireless in the media, which you know is somewhat misguided, but it, it's still a, lo a lot that is uh, um, um, said out there about how using open wireless networks uh, compromises your security because somebody could sniff the traffic. Now, the real solution for this is end-to-end -end security uh, through HTTPS uh, you know, or other solutions because that gives you true security through all the intermediate hops. It's not just about the question of getting security to the next hop, the Wi-Fi router. But since you know, this is something people are concerned about, a lot of applications still stuff send things in the clear. Um, uh, there's a mechanism to have secure open wireless without uh, having um, authentication and through a mechanism called EPTLS, and we will be supporting that as well. And that's it. So in summary, uh, you know, this is a hacker release. That's why we're uh, here at Hope uh, to release it. Uh, it's, and in my um, um, terminology, that's pre-alpha, and the purpose of the release is really to draw in developers, uh, and we have made the project very developer-friendly, and I, I have to credit my colleague uh, uh, Jacob here for, for really uh, making the project very usable uh, to new developers. Uh, and, and that's our goal, really, to be here at the conference, to bring you uh, and, uh, in and get you involved. Uh, and we can now really begin the process of uh, hardening the security on the device. And uh, as I mentioned, the hardware platform will change. So, you know, it is not an expensive platform. I encourage you to buy it. It's about $50 refurbished. Units are available on Newegg. Uh, but, you know, it may change in the future. So. And how can you help? Uh, so, you know, since security is so important, if you have expertise in security, uh, you can pen test, audit uh, the software. Uh, it is on GitHub. Uh, it will be, uh, the, the location will be announced on the EFF website, or uh, you can go to the download URL that I, I uh, pointed out earlier. You can extend it. The web UI is minimal. You may want to do something different. There may be a feature that's missing. Uh, please uh, uh, suggest it, add it, uh, and, and we'll be accepting pull requests on the GitHub. Uh, you can, uh, there are features that can be added to OpenWRT, the, the base that we're using itself. Two projects that I want to mention that will really help is people want to know where these open wireless access points are. So you, you, especially where it's most useful is you go to another city and you want to connect. So you want to know where they are. And some of the other systems, you know, you might have heard of Fawn or you know, Comcast Xfinity, they try to provide this kind of map. If one of you is interested in trying to create a map and uh, creating a system where people can easily find out where to get these uh, open wireless access points, you know, please come talk to me. I think that would be an awesome project. Uh, another is an open wireless app um, uh, instead of you know, just a web UI that we have today. And there's some additional cool things that can be done if we have apps on Android and, and iOS. And if you're interested in that also, please, please come talk to me. And then in terms of deployment, you know, that's where we can really use a lot of help is, is uh, you know, organizing maybe neighborhoods where a large number of people deploy open wireless is a great way uh, to really uh, make it useful uh, rather than it just be scattered over a large area. So neighborhoods or your city or town wants to do it, please come talk to us and we'll, we'll try to see what we can do to help make it happen. Great. Um, and, and that's that. That's, that's the project that we wanted to uh, announce and talk about and we're, we'd love to open it up to questions if anybody has any. I think but, we have uh, 11 minutes for questions. Yeah, we have 11 minutes. Thank you. So, yes, lying oh, behind that, uh, that halo of a silhouette that I can't see anything now. That I can see. Hi. Hello. Hello. Are you using one radio or two radio in that, radios in that AP? There are two. And you allow them to be on the same band? So there's a 5 gigahertz radio and there's a 2 gigahertz. Right, OK, so you have to have them separate. Yeah. Um, is there any reason why you're not running multiple SSID? Uh, I didn't understand the question. Multiple SSID meaning? You can run more than one SID, compartment them out into different LANs. So we, are, we have multiple SSIDs, right? There's the openwireless.org SSID. Yeah, I, I mean, I know it's an open WRT. I wrote the patent on it in 1999. <laughs> so uh, I think a part of the answer is we do allow them to be on the same band, if that's what you want. But not both radios. Both SIDs on the same radio is fine. Both radios on the same band, bad. And if I have to explain that to you, you're a non-starter. Um, 
Secondly, is there any chance you're gonna use like DNSSEC to sign that SSH key so you don't have that, you know, I've never seen this SSH key before, or if it has to change, you don't get the security warning. I mean, everybody in this room can deal with that. They know what they're doing. But if you start putting this out to homeowners, they're not gonna know what that means, right? I changed my SSH key and all of a sudden I can't log in anymore because I get the security warning. But if you DNSSEC sign it, it works. For the consumer release, there will be a, a way of logging stuff. That's Peter Eckersley, our technology director. So okay. I mean, I, I like the idea. It's a great legal hack. I don't see a lot of technology here, but I understand the legal hack. So, so we will be able to support DNSSEC on here because Cero were, you know, one of the features that they Great, have. You know, you know, Dave Tate, to. yay, right? Yes. Um, you might look at doing this with FreeBSD. Thanks. If you, if you want to help us do that, that would be great. You know, this is the best platform we could find right now. Hi. I wondered if you could speak to the issue of uh, terms of service with, with um, the, the major ISPs not allowing you to share bandwidth. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to give uh, of course legal not. advice to you. Um, a, a lot of... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll save that one in reserve. But okay. We, we can talk about it offline. Hey, so the main point is to uh, obfuscate multiple clients via having them all share the same IP address, uh, if, I, if I understand this correctly. One of, one of them. Right. So uh, the EFF has done uh, really nice research in the past on something called uh, Panopticlick, which uh, is a project that identifies uh, certain actors on the internet via uh, fingerprinting their web browser client uh, in various ways. And so uh, your own research is actually pointing towards another uh, vector in which a, a user could be identified, even if they are sharing the same wireless connection and so on. And I'm not saying this in order to take away from, from this uh, very promising project, but I think it would be interesting. Uh, have you considered uh, adding a proxy on, uh, or, or, or some sort of uh, DPI thing uh, on, on the router uh, level that would um, make, do some work to prevent the sort of panopticlick style identification of clients? Um, there are several problems with that approach. One of them is the wiretap act. Uh, that, that make it not legally very good if the person connecting to, to the network doesn't know and doesn't consent uh, to, to that approach. Um, it's, it's not one of the things we're thinking about right now, um, but one of the, so uh, Nadim raises the point of panoptic, panopticlick, which is that many, uh, if not most, uh, desktop web browsers are uniquely identifiable or damn close to it. One of the issues with panopticlick, though, is something like this, is not particularly identifiable. Um, and that mo mobile is one of the use cases uh, for open wireless. Um, so yeah, even though you can fingerprint a desktop browser with quite a bit of, uh, with, with many bits of, of entropy, um, fingerprinting a, an iOS or Android device is a lot harder. Um, I mean, another, another part of the answer is that defending against fingerprinting is really hard. Uh, it's not impossible, maybe, we're gonna try, but the better place to be trying to do it is inside the client. Uh, you have a better chance with a browser extension or with browser patches actually against the, the you would call browser code than you do sitting on the network and frankly really man in the middle attacking some subset of the traffic and trying to, to hide the revealing nature of the data point. And, and one of the points of the Open Wireless Project is that, as, as Peter raises, we're not man in the middling your connection. Um, Open wireless as it exists right now at cafes, at the Hotel Pennsylvania, the hotel that we're staying at, um, man in the middle's your connection, right? When you first get this, that's the captive portal problem. And the captive portal problem is really bad and breaks a lot of stuff. It trains users to click, you know, uh, this, this certificate is not, um, it's not correct. Um, and we don't want, the, the open wireless um, project will not man in the middle connections, uh, either in a captive portal situation or DPI to try and get rid of the browser fingerprint. Um, it's one of the policy positions that we've taken here. Uh, my question is uh, if I'm a user of you know this and I get a DMC notice about something I know I did not download and it was through my open thing, you say, oh, there's a legal precedent for this. So what's my 
next step? And is that, um, I'm not asking a personal legal advice question, I'm asking a general question. And um, is that practical for regular users? So if you say, oh, write a letter to your, demand letter to your ISP, I mean, like, is this something a regular user can actually do? Or is um, this something you have to call a lawyer for? It's probably something you have to call a lawyer for. Whenever you get a, a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit, calling a lawyer is one of the steps that I, as a lawyer, would probably recommend you do. So you should have a lawyer on retainer if you're using... <laughs> no, I, I mean, should, should all of you have a lawyer on retainer? Yeah, it's probably a good idea, right? <laughs> just in general, whether you're using open wireless or not. Uh, I'm just mean it increases the cost. Full, full employment for lawyers. <laughs> significantly. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but there are, uh, EFF maintains a list of lawyers who do this sort of work. So, you know, info at EFF.org is a great email address that you should have uh, at the tip of your fingers. Right do you anticipate now. having like some form things that people can be like, if you get a DMCA, here's the open wireless, you know, form letter you can send your ISP. And That's something that we might consider. Yeah. Okay. There's also, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm going to say this. There's a certain kind of case that EFF is always looking to hear about. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my 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 question is a little tangential to that. Maybe Tech has already answered it, and I it was too condensed for me or something. But chiefly, when I have a user or you know a guest, I don't typically you know a few people are wicked. But very many people are gullible or heedless, and they click on a link that I wouldn't touch with a barge pole, and I end up infected with a root kit or viruses or all kinds of vermin. And I, you know, and I, you know, and you know, the guy will, have, you know, you know, he will be perfectly innocent. He won't have been trying to do anything, you know. You, you know, shady or anything like that, but I end up with uh, my, my, my computer in jeopardy, and you know, and I wonder, and I wonder about situations like that, how you can separate partition, you know, uses, you, you, uses that might be hurtful, that are have no malicious or you know shadowy intent. From the user, he just clicked on something that you know <laughs> that he shouldn't have, and I end up with the debris. Do you want to talk about that? How the networks are partitioned? Yeah. So you know, one of the reasons to provide the VPN option yeah. or the TOR option for both the private and the um, open one is if you choose, let's say, to have a VPN on the open one, all your traffic would be completely separate from the guest traffic. So if he was doing something you know, that could potentially be problematic with law enforcement, they would see that, okay, that came from a different address. I'm talking about the integrity of my CPU. He gets this message and it contains a virus or something like that. So there shouldn't be any reason that traffic from the open wireless is even getting into your network, right? So there is, they're, they're separated. There, there, there is no way that the, um, the guest users are able to see devices in your home. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking about privacy. I'm talking about like this guy downloaded something. That that'll it, affect it, his it, computer, but not yours. No? Well, it'll it affect his machine, it. not your machine. No, it just it just it's going to pass <laughs> through the router. The router is not going to be affected. They're not going to be affected. I mean, they're they're going to be affected. You're never never going to see it. Um, we have time for one more question, but. I want to hear what you guys have to say and uh, come, come find us afterwards. Uh, okay, I'll try to make it a good one then. Um, <laughs> just want to know, so this is a, a Tor client. Have you considered add, adding an uh, option for Tor transit or exit nodes to increase the Tor network bandwidth total? So it would be very easy to do that. And you know, we, from the SSH access, you can do that because the Tor binary is in there. You can set it up to do that. We won't have it set up like that by default because it uses up people's bandwidth and we want people to make the choice to do that and we will make it easier for them. To and in, in terms of exit node, we're probably not going to have that as an option. Um, 
running a Tor exit node, uh, the, the, the Tor project uh, benefits from, from large, low latency, high bandwidth exit nodes running on real hardware, um, not Soho router at a, on a DSL. Um, a whole bunch of really small, really slow Tor exit nodes is the last thing that Tor needs. Um, it might be good for privacy, but it's, it's, it doesn't work with the spec. So, you know, but it is probably good as, as a bridge. So, you know, if you are traveling uh, remote, you know, outside the country and you want to first hop off of your own home network and then, you know, access Tor, you know, that it, it's useful for those kinds of things. Um, so, as, as Adi said, uh, unfortunately, this is the last question. That was the last question that we can take. Um, but in terms of coming and finding us after, EFF is having a speakeasy at a bar called American Whiskey, which is like a block and a half away, starting in four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> uh, and we will be there. Um, drinks are not on us, they are on you. So uh, bring, bring a couple of bucks and let's have a beer. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.